You are listening to Hit Play, Not Pause, a feisty menopause podcast for active, performance-minded women. I am your host, Celine Yeager. Each week, I bring you advice from athletes, scientists, researchers, and other experts to help you feel and perform your best, no matter what your hormones are doing. This show is a production of Live Feisty Media. Hello, strong, feisty women. I hope you all are well. So just a few notes before we get into it this week. First, I want to thank you for your kind words on the question and answer episode that we did a couple of weeks ago. Those are always a little more work for me to do because I want to give useful info and it's super important for me to get things right. So it's really satisfying when I get positive feedback there. And I was especially pleased to hear from a plastic surgeon in the audience who said she was impressed and maybe surprised at, quote, my excellent and balanced response to the plastic surgery question. And I'm guessing she was surprised because she expected it wouldn't be quite so balanced. But even though it was clear, I'm sure, that I am not exactly pro-plastic surgery, and I wasn't in this case, I, I don't ever want to be dismissive or judgmental, because I do see that there are lots of women in our community who have gone that route. And I'm not here to tell anyone what they should or shouldn't do or pass judgment on any of that. So anyway, the surgeon went on to say that she definitely makes sure that women are optimized non-surgically before resorting to any form of surgery. And she often refers people to the show and to the book Next Level. And I just wanted to say thank you for taking the time to drop me that note. It really means a lot. And also Kate Sell um, dropped me a line as well. She was the one who had migraines and was kind of upset that she couldn't use hormone therapy because she was a bit older. And uh, she wanted to let me know that she did indeed find a provider who is working with her and she is now taking hormone therapy as well as SSRIs to help prevent migraines, which she says she still doesn't get, she does indeed get post-menopause. In fact, they got worse. So She let me know that she found someone, and so far, so good. Things seem to be working out. Fingers crossed. Thank you, Kate Sell, for reaching out. I really, really appreciate it. And um, keep the questions coming. They're fun to do. I mean, at this point, I'm doing maybe one or two a year, and that feels like about the right amount. Okay. So this week, I had the chance to sit down with Meredith Root, the co-founder, along with her partner, Alex Parker, of Tactic Functional Nutrition and a brand new sister business, Tactic Functional Fitness, which is set to release this coming Monday after the U.S. Thanksgiving. So check their website for that. I will definitely put a link to it in the show notes so it's easy to find. Meredith has been in the nutrition coaching business since 2015. She and Alex founded Tactic Functional Nutrition in 2018. They both have CrossFit backgrounds. Um, they now employ a team of about 10 coaches and they work with people from all over the globe on health and habits. Meredith started in biological engineering and she combines that background with a very empathetic and open communication style and creates evidence-based coaching for everyone from Olympic athletes to everyday folks. She and Alex have amassed a huge online following, especially on Instagram, where they push back really hard on some of the destructive narratives that keep women from reaching their full potential. And they've posted a few times about menopause, but one post in particular that they put up in September was about how too many menopausal women are vulnerable to predatory marketing especially in the diet industry, because of the longstanding shame, silence, and paucity of research surrounding menopausal women. And they described it, I think, as progressive invisibility of these women. And it just really struck a chord. You know, I saw it and I thought, this is really great because they are both quite young. And I'm like, this is cool to see younger women coming into this space and addressing these issues. And then my inbox sort of started blowing up with lots of people forwarding that post to me. So I knew it was resonating with many of you as well. So I thought, why not reach out and see if we can have a conversation? And we did. And it was a really, really enjoyable one. We talked about how she and Alex started their business 
their thoughts, their philosophies regarding nutrition and nutrition coaching, especially for menopausal women, which make up a bulk of their clientele. And of course, we talk about some broad brush recommendations for our demographic. I really, really enjoyed this one, and I hope you do as well. All right, before we get to it, as always, check us out on Instagram and Facebook at Feisty Menopause. Sign up for my free weekly newsletter at feistymenopause.com. While you're there, check out our Level Up membership, where you get personal time with experts of all kinds each and every month. And as always, thank you for the five-star ratings and great reviews. I have some really awesome guests coming up, and it really helps sell the show to potential guests in a very crowded podcast marketplace. All right, very quickly, thank you, Prevenex, for your continued support and supporting this show. We talk about Joint Health Plus and all the amazing letters I get all the time about how it's given people their active lives back. But I also get tons of great reviews about their Omega-3 product, which I also use and is certainly the best I have taken, and about their Immune Health Plus product, which the feisty team swears by, especially when they have a bunch of travel on deck and they don't want to get sick. So thank you, Prevenex, for your support. All right, truly enough of me. Let's have a few quick words about our awesome sponsors and get on with the show. All right, Meredith, uh, I am very excited to have you here. I love your presence on Instagram. Like your messaging, I'm very grateful for Amanda, friend of the show that I've had on That's a couple great. times. Yeah, to make the connection. Um, for people who may not be familiar, I'd love to lay a little groundwork for the audience, especially like your background. Do you have a, a BS in biological engineering? I re read and, you know, you spent a few years in the biopharmaceutical process development. I'm not sure what that is. So mm -hmm. could you talk a bit about what those jobs were about and how you found your way into this place of nutrition? Yeah, it's sort of a winding road, but, um, my background is in biotech, industrial microbiology. So, um, essentially after I graduated, I worked for a large biopharmaceutical company, um, basically figuring out how to take, uh, cells growing at research and development scale. So I'm, I'm sure most people are familiar with like a Petri dish, what that is. So essentially that and figuring out how to grow those cells and products in like a 10,000 liter bioreactor. So, wow. um, cause there's, there's a lot that goes into that. You can't just like toss cells into a big tank right. and expect them to do what you want. So, um, you know, in a major way, like cell culture health is essentially it comes down to like cellular, cellular nutrition and, um, oxygen transfers. So like I thought I, I did a lot of work on, uh, on bubbles. Like it, it sounds sort of silly, but, um, when you're scaling products like that up, it's about keeping cells healthy and breathing and respirating without tearing them apart in the bioreactor. So you kind of have to be able to uh, model things like, um, yeah, gas entrance velocity, oxygen transfer rates, impeller speeds, because if those things are very different as you, um, you know, move to a manufacturing scale, you're going to get a different product. So my favorite line from biomanufacturing and, and something that's just like drilled into you if you work in this industry is this whole idea that the, the process is the product. So mm -hmm. large molecules, monoclonal antibodies, fusion proteins, those are more complicated to make than things like small molecules, like Advil, antihistamines. Um, it takes weeks to produce biologic uh, pharmaceutical products and a deviation in process parameters, temperature, pH, dissolved oxygen, things like that can start to really compound into product quality issues at the end. So the only way you can guarantee that the product quality is what you want is by measuring and controlling the process. Like the process is the product, which is this amazing parallel into the way that I think about human nutrition and performance, because it's, I think it's, it's the same, like the process is everything. The work that you do is, is the way, and that's ultimately what determines the end product or for humans, um, the result. So that's, um, that's a lot of what I did. I took a hiatus from my work in biotech, um, to play at CrossFit for like 18 months. <laughs> um, I was doing CrossFit, uh, competitively, and kind of just wanted to see if I could qualify to compete at the highest level, which is the CrossFit games. So, um, I was always planning on going back to working in the biopharmaceutical field because I really love it, but I met Alex somewhere in there. So Alex is my partner. She's my wife, um, and decided that she was too incredible to pass up. Like, I mean, you know, you, you meet those people and when you know, you know, so I, I picked up my life, which at the time was in Raleigh, North Carolina and moved to Calgary, Alberta, um, 
And there's not much of a biotech presence in Calgary, which I learned. Um, so tactic, uh, tactic came from a place of necessity as well as, um, a place of, of passion. Like we, I had been doing nutrition coaching for some time. Um, obviously dabbling with my own nutrition as an athlete and then helping people on the side. Um, I had started working part-time for another nutrition coaching company. So, um, Alex just had decided she wasn't going to practice as a lawyer because she, she had gone to law school. She had, um, in Alberta, you don't take the bar and then practice. You have to do a year of articling, which is kind of like residency for lawyers. Uh, and then you, you are, you're called to the bar. So she was called to the bar and then basically immediately quit. So that's not for me, uh, which I don't blame her. The lifestyle is really brutal. So we, we kind of put our heads together and launched tactic in, uh, the late summer of 2018, uh, after my CrossFit games appearance. So took full advantage of my 15 seconds of fame that came from, from that. Cause that's just like, you're kind of a flash in the pan, especially me. Like I knew I was only going to go once. I was not going to be a perennial, um, CrossFit games athlete. It was like, boom, done. Everybody's like super into you. And then they're on to whoever else is coming next year. So kind of took advantage of that. And then we've just been working hard ever since to kind of stay true to our values as people, as business owners, as bosses, and gave it the time that it needed to grow into what it is now, which doesn't happen without a, yeah, some evolution along the way. But I guess that's, that's kind of the cool thing about doing your own, you know, being your own boss and owning the company is you can let it evolve versus working for someone else. You have to kind of like stay in their, uh, you know, in their parameters, even if you're like, I really would love to work in a different way with people. So in a nutshell, that's, that's me. That's very cool. That's very cool. Yeah. I'm I'm a huge science geek, so that whole that bubble process was really mm. fascinating to me. Yes. <laughs> um, where did the name tactic function nutrition come functional nutrition? Come oh from? man. Um, we had a few names in mind when we were thinking up names, which is a whole thing when you're starting a business. Um, and that was that was just one of them. Um, it was. I don't even remember what we had one that we really liked, but we couldn't, it was, it didn't make it through uh, our trademark search. It was basically a no, no from our, our lawyer who is an Alex, Alex, she's not <laughs> our lawyer. <laughs> um, so we landed on, on tactic. I think just, it felt catchy and like something that, um, people would remember. And I think at that time it was a little bit controversial because, you know, I had a name for myself in the space, not only as a, a CrossFit athlete, but as a, I had developed somewhat of a, a reputation, um, in the nutrition, in the nutrition space. And then Alex is also quite well known because she competed at the CrossFit Games. So it felt, I think a lot of people were a little bit, uh, caught off guard that we would, we would actually create a, a brand that was not associated with our personal identities. Like almost that, you know, mm. we were, we were giving up some, um, some audience there, which maybe we did. I don't, there's not really a way to measure it, but ultimately, I think we both kind of saw the chessboard and that we wanted tactic to be something that it could eventually stand up on its own two legs and not rely on our, you know, our, our personal identities as athletes. Because one of the things that really annoyed me uh, years ago, and it still bothers me sometimes is when people think that we're just athletes and, um, and they think that's our credential. They think that's, you know, we're relying on that because there are a lot of athletes who, who do fitness coaching, who do nutrition coaching and yeah, that's it. But we always wanted to be something more than that. Um, and that was a big reason why we selected, uh, tactic and, and decided to brand ourselves in that way. Excellent. Well, it's interesting because, you know, one of the things I note when I, when I go through your, your Instagram, which has, you know, a very large presence is that a lot of your posts aren't actually about nutrition per se you know they're 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 more about our relationship to it and I, I'd love for you to talk a bit about that and how that came to be right if if you scroll way back like all the way to the bottom you'll see that our our posts used to be a lot more about nutrition specifically about performance nutrition because we came into the space kind of thinking we would be like a performance nutrition company that we would work with athletes and people like us. And then somewhere along the way, we started working with a lot more non-athletes, which frankly, like I enjoy a lot more because you can really change people's lives with that. And then in the process of, of working with kind of just normal people, everyday people who are just trying to be healthier, they're trying to get the most out of their hour in the gym and just feel good about what they're doing with their bodies and what they're putting into it. We discovered it's not 
really lack of information that keeps people from making progress with nutrition. Like I would just throw information at people all the time. And, you know, I'm like, eventually they're going to be compelled by this, but they're just not. Um, like I'm, I'm fairly compelled by information. Those people are out there for sure. Uh, but what we found was most people struggle with, um, either their relationship with food or, um, they just struggle to, to implement new habits. They struggle with behavior change. And so a lot of our, our content started just to, to shift slowly over time towards, uh, yeah, more towards psychology and, um, and you know, the habit stuff, behavior change, our philosophy as we've developed it, working with people, like a lot of the stuff that we post about is, is from our brains. I mean, we, we share from other people as well. And we, you know, we've curated our approach and understanding, um, certainly on the, the shoulders of other people in the space. Um, yeah, but, uh, but a lot of what we share is based on our, our experience working with people for these last kind of like, you know, six years for me going on like eight years. And, um, we find that that's the information that people need to hear. They need to sort of learn how to be more gentle with themselves when they are struggling. They need to learn how to conceptualize why change is, change is difficult. Um, you know, develop an understanding of why they do things that maybe don't make sense in the context of their goals and, um, kind of just develop the habit of, uh, getting on the path and then being okay with stepping off the path and then just getting back on the path. Okay. I stepped off the path again. Now I'm going to get back on. Like, it sounds really simple. Um, but it's not, I mean, it's not easy, I guess it is simple. It's not easy. So that's, uh, that's kind of where that shift has come from. A hundred percent. I mean, having been sort of in this industry since the nineties, um, you know, I think that yeah, the information, I mean, especially now, there's so much information and, and, you know, probably too much and we can talk about that, but but there's definitely an all or nothing sort of mindset still that that persists, right? And and uh, and when it comes to nutrition, I think it re people really get entrenched that they have to be yeah. like this way all the time or or nothing. Yeah, exactly. And I think nutrition is one of those rare things that you can get into adulthood and um, not have a lot of knowledge about, like, just because you eat three or four times a day does not mean that you know anything about nutrition. So it's, uh, I always say it'd be easier to change someone's religion than it is to change their nutrition. And because um, it's not, you can't outsource it. No one can eat your food for you. It's not like drinking alcohol that you can just stop doing or smoking that you can just stop doing. You still have to eat three or four times a day. Um, so there's an enormous opportunity for positive change. Certainly there's also an enormous opportunity for, uh, some not so good habits to develop over time that, that just can be very difficult to break. And then people have a really hard time with this idea that they are a novice when it comes to nutrition, when they're in their thirties or forties or fifties, like it's really hard to wrap your head around that. Um, and people feel really embarrassed that they struggle mm -hmm. with it. And that embarrassment and the struggle and the shame and the fear of failure prevents them from actually making changes. Oh, that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could, I could see that. You know, the, the reason that we are talking today is, is, you know, perhaps that, that older demographic that you're talking about, which I think I heard you talk on your menopause podcast is a large percentage of your population is in sort of mm -hmm. that perimenopause, menopausal age demographic. And you had put up a post, it's been several weeks now, uh, your partner, Alex actually did it, which, you know, she called, she, she just basically talked about menopause and said, yes, we are for you. And you sort of talked about this concept of progressive invisibility, which definitely got a resounding response. And I was curious, I mean, I got it sent like a million times. Mm. It's like, yes, I see it. You're both fairly young, quite young. What inspired you to talk about menopause now and that particular post? Um, we've posted about menopause a, a few times. It's certainly not like we don't hold ourselves out as as experts on the topic. And we we certainly wouldn't um, market towards those people. I have a, a big problem with, uh, with companies and products and people that do market aggressively towards, uh, women in menopause, which maybe is another topic. Um, but yeah, it always gets a big response. And I, I think, um, menopause and by extension, women's health is just historically really not, like not talked about by women at any age. And I, I think, you know, we can all, I don't know if this is just me. I don't like to, um, project my experience, but I, I you know, I remember, 
sex education and you're learning about the menstrual cycle, um, in school and you're just kind of like, what? And so you learn about it, but then also it's just kind of, it's then, it, then it's, it's like, Hey, you, you had the class, you learned about it. Now don't talk about it. And, you know, you go by as a kid, um, or a teenager, or a young adult, like you go by tampons and you like hide them, <laughs> um, you know, cause heaven forbid someone know that, you know, you go through a normal, perfectly normal, uh, experience every, every month. So it's, it's not just menopause. I think it's yeah. women's health. Um, but anyways, I think the more that we can talk about it, uh, the more that we can encourage others to, uh, also talk about it and share their experience. And the more they do that, the more people can connect. Um, and also, you know, we feel like we can help point people in a, a more evidence-based direction. Cause there's just like, there's just so much misinformation out there. Um, we're both in our mid thirties. Uh, we have a good friend, the one who was on our podcast about when we, we brought her on to talk about menopause and women's health, um, Beth Bacon, she started going through early menopause in her mid thirties. And so we talk about it because we're eventually going to experience it as well, whether it happens in five years or in 15 years. So I don't think it's, you can ever start too early as mm. far as like learning about it, uh, wrapping your head around it. And, you know, if you have a platform speaking about it, um, our, our society really tries to sweep aging women under the rug. And so that's where that term that we use progressive invis invisibility comes from. So women, we think, uh, women suffer from ageism in a very different way than men do. Um, and I'm sure you've seen headlines, um, about some women in Hollywood aging naturally. And often it's, it's, you know, they're called brave and bold. And like recently Pamela Anderson was at fashion week in Paris and her whole thing was she, she didn't have a stylist with her. She had no one to do her hair. She decided to not wear any makeup and the internet just erupted at how brave that was. And, you know, Sally Fields also gets the same kind of treatment. So it's, it's frustrating. It's like, why is it, why is it brave for women to do that? Um, uh, but it's just normal for men. So, um, and I, I think that's just, that's a reflection of our society. It's not just a Hollywood thing. So I think, you know, because of this and because that's been our society for a really long time, there's been a disproportionately small amount of time and money uh, dedicated to women's health research when compared to to men. Research just wasn't done on women for a long time. And and unlike men, women, women really have to advocate for their own health um, to be heard by their physicians and by their doctors. I mean, a man can walk into the doctor, like grunt a few times, like, huh, huh, you know, point to his crotch and walk out with a prescription of Viagra. Like that's how easy it is. But, you know, women go to the doctor and they have to describe a plethora of symptoms, often many of them extremely personal in great detail to maybe get some help from their doctor, maybe. And that's if they even know what symptoms to maybe. To talk about. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, it's a huge problem, like lack of information, knowing what is normal, no knowing what's not normal knowing what to talk to your doctor about, knowing what to do if your doctor doesn't give you the answers that you want, or they say things like, it's just natural, you just have to deal with it, which is not an acceptable response to get from your doctor. And you should go find a new one at that point, but how do you go find a new one? What are the resources? So I think it's a huge problem that we should all, like we should all be concerned with, and not just women. I think this is a, a, a problem that is so significant that you know, it should concern men as well, because women are a huge part of our society and they have been for a long time. It's only, you know, recently that they've been aggressively ignored um, as a part of the sort of scientific rev revolution of the 20th century. So yeah, that's, that's progressive invis invisibility is probably putting it lightly. If you ask a lot of people. Yeah. It, you sound, you sound a lot like I do on this show often. <laughs> I, it, it's, you know, and, and it did take, you know, I'm I'm super, I'm not cynical by nature, but I am very uh, clear eyed that it, that it took a lot of money and it becoming a giant demographic worth $600 billion, you know, and now you have Oprah talking about menopause and now you have, you know, now it it's out there everywhere, which causes its own set of problems. But yes. I think in the balance that it's a positive because, you know, it, it is getting much more attention and the genie's not going back into the bottle, you know, per no. se. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's interesting. You had shared with me, you know, in our earlier correspondence setting up this interview that that sometimes when you talk about menopause because you are younger, the responses are not always mm -hmm. um, well received. You know, what what has that been like for you? 
Yeah. It's almost like it's, you know, some women and it's, I'll get into it, but it's like, it's a, a, it's like a club. It's like a, no, this is our terrible club and you're not invited because you're not old enough. So you're not allowed to talk about it because you haven't had the experience. And like, I mean, I get it. Um, you know, it's mixed. We don't get that all the time, but like, it's definitely, um, it's definitely something that we, we hear and we try to get, people will try to discount our voice in the space. And I think, you know, that it comes from a place of women just wanting to be, be seen and, you know, feel like they're being heard. And when they see us, they don't see themselves. So like, I can understand where that frustration comes from, but at the same time, if the only credential or the only prerequisite that you have when searching for experts or voices in the space is that they share the experience with you, that can introduce a lot of bias and certainly opens up the door um, to misinformation and, uh, you know, sales of, of products and approaches that are are really not um, appropriate or effective. Um, so it would be you know, in my opinion, and not to like, again, not to reduce anyone's experience, it would be like only working with a dentist who's had a root canal, if you're going in Mm. for a root canal, like it's, it sounds, it's silly when you think about it, but again, like I get it. I think women just like desperately want to be seen and heard. And when they hear someone talking about something that's deeply personal to them, that that person hasn't been through, I can understand how that would trigger some, some feelings and emotions with people. So I try to not, um, I try to not judge people too harshly for that. Yeah. I, and I get, you know, to be clear, I, I, I do get it too. I, I, you know, it was interesting watching because, you know, I, I can see where I sat when I was in my thirties and even in my forties. And I was so blindsided by the change that I really thought wouldn't ever happen to me. Like so many women think it's like, oh, it's not going to be that for me. And so I think very often that response is a knee jerk response because and I was guilty of this as a younger trainer myself, and I've apologized a million times on the show. I never really, really believed the women when like it happened overnight, but my God, it mm-hmm. really seems like it happens overnight. And when you look at the hormone profiles of what happens to them, you're like, oh, it really does happen very quickly, you know? So you can, you can understand it better. And I, you know, I think that's where a lot of them are coming from. It's just, they have been disregarded for so long and they, they themselves didn't really believe it when they were younger, what, Mm. how, you know, what, what the experience could be like. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, I think that you're just sort of the, you know, you're just there getting all of that emotion and response. um, It's just directed. You're the the proxy for it. Like I I understand that. Yeah. A hundred percent. So. Yeah. But I, I do, I think, you know, and I said that to you, online you know i said i i think it is important that that women uh, across the the generations and across the age spans and lifespans just normalize the conversation about it because that yeah. that's the goal is the goal is that it's not this mysterious thing you know are this like you said this terrible club it's not actually a terrible club <laughs> um you know that that it's just like a, a a part of life that we all go through and we just have a better understanding and a better openness about it. And I think the more like yourselves that are talking about it, the, the better that is. So exactly. Yeah. yeah. And we don't, we don't come on and try to say that we have the answers or, you know, if you do, if you just do what we recommend that you won't have any symptoms, but, and like there, those people that are definitely out there. So I think we just try to tread really lightly and be really sensitive when we talk about it um, because it is such a, yeah, it's such a, a sensitive topic for so many people. What are the common when women? I mean, I guess I have a couple of questions about that. So you have a large percentage of women who are in this um, phase of life or in the demographic. Are they coming to you with sort of what we typically hear, like everything was great and working and then suddenly it wasn't? Are there common threads that you see in that population that is, you know, hiring your services? Yeah. Um, I'd say it's, it's pretty common for people to lead with that information. Like it's of, of all the people that we work with and, you know, we, we work with a large population of people who are in this uh, phase of life, but it's not our, you know, it's not, it's not our entire clientele. Um, but more than any demographic that we work with, they, they put that information up front more than anyone else. Um, it's almost like there's an, an email template for people going through, uh, for women in the win- the menopause transition, it's like, you know, hi, I'm so and so, I'm in perimenopause. Can you help me? And like that's it's some variation of that. Mm. Uh, 
pretty frequently. So it's, it's almost like it's become like, it's a major part of their identity. Um, and it gets talked about almost as if it's like a debilitating condition, Mm -hmm. which again, it can feel that way for sure. Um, and I think because of that, many women come in with a lot of fear. Um, I think because they feel sort of helpless, they've, they've probably tried a few things before, uh, to help. Um, or they come in with beliefs that things need to be done in a very specific way because of their hormonal status. Like, you know, there's a specific combination of foods or a specific macronutrient breakdown or specific fasting windows that will help them. And, you know, they want us to have those answers. Um, but the, yeah, mostly the common thread is that they just, they really want someone to help them through this time. And that's, that's probably why they they put that information out there. So, you know, right up front, it's like, here it is, here I am. Can you help me? Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I imagine a lot of them have heard about, or perhaps tried themselves the many diets. And I, I despair of the diets. Mm-hmm. Um, women in this time are, are so vulnerable. And I hear from my, you know, we have, I don't know, 30,000 women in the community now, but they, you know, they're devastated. Like, like, like it's not an overstatement to say that a lot of these women are devastated, you know, because they've been athletic. They, 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 they do Ironman, they do cross, they do all these things. Their body X plus Y has always equaled Z, right? Like the work you put in is the, the result you get out. And as an athlete, it's really hard to hit a place where all of a sudden that's just not happening. And you are just very open, I think, to some of the extremes out there, whether it be like the keto thing or the, you know, mm-hmm. eat within six hours of your day or, um, you know, and I wonder how you, because you do take this holistic approach with women our bodies change and not a single one of us, no matter what we do is going to look at 80 as we did at 60, as we did at 40, as we did, you know, I mean, so it's going to change over time. Mm -hmm. How how do you, how do you work with an individual woman who is coming to you um, and help her make both the nutritional changes, but also the setting the goals and the psychological adjustments that might be necessary? Yeah, it's kind of, it's two beasts um, because on one hand you have just, you have age related changes to uh, your body, which happened to men as well. And men also struggle with, uh, mm-hmm. with the aging process and what that can look and feel like if they've been active, if they've been athletes. So it's not something that's necessarily exclusive to women. Uh, I think women have a different pressure on them, especially women going through menopause right now. If you think about the generation that they came from, they came from the generation who's you know, whose parents, it was the thin generation. And, um, there were women growing up in the nineties, which, um, or or they were in adulthood in the nineties. And so the nineties was an awful time for, uh, for the diet industry and the fitness industry. So that you're coming in with a lot of, um, sort of preconceptions and pressure to look a certain way. And that's going to change regardless of hormonal status. And then on top of that, you have the hormonal shit storm that is menopause and it can cause devastating symptoms, Um, and it can cause psychological symptoms. Like a lot of women, um, they get to, uh, menopause and this is, uh, this is a bit of a tangent, but, um, you know, the, there's also this silent generation of women who were, uh, may struggle with things like ADHD and, um, and were undiagnosed because for a long time they didn't, they didn't do research on girls. And so they just, they thought it was a boy condition. And so, uh, Mel Robbins talks about this a lot and she's someone who, who, is, you know, in her late fifties and she's around 57. And so she's going through this ADHD diagnosis at the same time that she's going through menopause. And, um, this, the second, the first most common time for women now to get diagnosed with, with ADHD is after the birth of their first child. The second most common time is during the menopause transition. Hmm. So, um, there's all kinds of things that can happen during that time. So I think that the, you know, when we have success working with people, uh, who are going through the menopause transition, it's, it's because they're open to putting a lot of focus on non-physical components and indicators of progress. So if we can get women, um, in the gym, lifting weights, exercising, if we can build a really good foundation of nutrition, just really basic, nothing weird. Um, 
you know, no fasting, just like, let's do the basics. And, uh, if we can get people, yeah, if we can get women in, into an exercise routine and they start seeing progress there, despite of the, despite the way that they're feeling, it really can kind of shift them into a more positive mindset and a more forgiving mindset for themselves. And I don't know if that's, uh, you know, if it's one part distraction, if it, it's just like something else to focus on, um, or if there's, you know, there's an actual shift going on, but that's, that's the pattern that we see with, with women, if they make positive, when they make positive changes with, with us is just taking the focus off of, I don't look the way that I used to look, because frankly, you're never going to look the way that you used to look. And if you, the, the sooner that you can accept that, um, the better, I mean, I'm 35 and I could easily, like, I don't look the way that I looked when I was 27, but is it worth like lamenting over that? No. Um, I just, you know, I focus on what I'm doing with my body. Am I happy with how it's performing and moving? And I understand that there is probably a shift coming for me at some point where even those things are going to feel different. So it's like, can you focus on just like tiny little things that can you find the positives somewhere? Um, and if you can, it's just like, you take it day by day. It's just like, okay, today I did my best. I did this. I'm happy with that. Let's move on. Yeah. I, I think that's very, very wise advice. It, it's sort of making me, it's echoes of Melanie McQuaid. I'm not sure if you know who mm. she is. Um, she's a multi-time world champion. She's a triathlete, but she just actually literally made history as qualifying in the pro field for the world championships in Ironman at age 50. Like nobody has, yeah, nobody has done that. And she, she completed it. And I had her, I did a live podcast on the ground. And one of the things she said, she's like, my body is super resistant to any fat loss at this point. Like, it's just yeah. not, ha you know, with the, like when those hormones fluctuate, I mean, it, it <laughs> and it, she wasn't saying that even a year ago. I mean, it just sort of happened kind of quickly, but she's like, fuck it. I'm fast. She's like, she's like, I'm yeah. working on being strong. Like that is where I'm at. Like, I'm not looking back. There's no point in looking back. Like, what yeah. are my opportunities in front of me? And what can I do with this body that I'm in? And apparently you can do an awful lot, you know, of amazing things with it. So I think that yeah. is great advice at the base. I think the, and that speaks in a, a major way to how important the way that you identify is. I mean, she's someone who identifies as an athlete, um, still, and she's performing very well, um, and has her whole life. So she has practice in that mindset. So even when things go a little sideways with her physical body and the way that it looks, that's not her identity, but imagine, um, you know, you're a woman who, who maybe wasn't an athlete, maybe doesn't have any history in the gym. Um, but you know, your identity as a, a woman is the way you look. Cause that's right. hello for society. And, um, you know, you look a certain way, mid twenties, thirties, maybe if you're lucky into your forties and then things start to change. So your whole identity, this thing, yeah. this, the, the way that you look, how much you weigh, the clothes that you can fit in, if that changes, like it can be a really rough and rude awakening. Cause like that, like you said, everyone's going to, at some point, uh, look and a look very different than the way they did when they're young. So it's, I think it's probably more difficult for some people. And again, I think men are, are also, they experience this as well and probably don't talk about it because men struggle to talk about anything, but, um, when your identity is your appearance, yeah, that's going to be really tough. Well, and I think, you know, I agree with you about men. I also, when you look back and you see like how women just publicly though were have mm -hmm. been sort of like made to value with nothing but that you know like oh my god on every like, sphere like when when jennifer lopez goes to the beach in a bikini and what makes the front of a magazine cover is the fact that her cellulite is showing like what the hell then you start seeing those magazine covers when you're like a 10 year old girl so it is just like burned into your brain that this shit matters when it it doesn't matter. And it definitely doesn't matter for men. So yeah, I agree with you 100% on that. Yeah. And you look back at the people we like that we, the culture called quote unquote fat, like, mm -hmm. um, oh, what was that terrible movie about the diaries? Um, oh, Renee Bridget Zellick. Jones. She Horrible. was 138 pounds. Yeah. I mean, when I look back, I'm like, oh my God, what have we done? What yes. is, you know, like, yeah. Basically any movie that I watch from the early 2000s that I think I'm going to enjoy, I'm just like, 
oh god yeah it's, it's really it's yeah terrible. it's literally terrible yeah. so yeah it is it's hard it's really hard i'm very sympathetic to that that is very hard <laughs> to break out of that like must be as small as possible and i'm i'm glad to see and and correct me if i'm wrong i mean i feel like your generation my i have a daughter who's 21 and her generation i definitely feel has a better relationship with that um just because there's a broader there's just a broader standard of like being more naturally built mm -hmm. you know you don't have to be skinny yeah and i mean the you know the internet the internet is um you know it can be horrible and it can also be really great and i think the really great part of the you know, the internet and social media is that it allows people to connect and share kind of normal experiences. And even celebrities now, um, the, the way that they exist in the public eye is different. You're seeing more behind the scenes. You're seeing more normalization of different bodies in, um, you know, in the public eye. And so I, I think that that shift is a, a real one. And it's, it's because of the amount of connection that, um, you know, our generation has, and then, you know, the generation behind us that the, you know, the generations before us definitely didn't have. Yeah, no, I 100% yeah. agree. We had beauty magazines. <laughs> yeah, which is exactly right. That's hugely problematic. <laughs> hugely problematic. So when you are working with this, um, you know, aside from that psychological piece, which honestly, I think is more than half of the game, are there broad brush dietary guidelines? I mean, I, I think about like protein, I think fiber, I think the stuff that I know a lot of people are not addressing even carbohydrates, the people who are just like, I can't eat, you know, a grain. Um, are, are there broad brush dietary thoughts that you have for this demographic that you see, you know, as a trend of things that, that women are not doing enough or could use more of? Yeah, um, definitely. Like we focus on the low hanging fruit first. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I think that the approach should always be like, keep it as simple as possible for as long as possible. Like, you think, um, or we want to think about what is the, the lowest effective dose for any intervention. Yeah. Like we don't need to go crazy. There are all kinds of crazy diets that people can do out there and they probably have tried them and they haven't been able to stick with them because they're too freaking crazy. Um, so what we look for, and what we recommend for women is, uh, number one, a regular eating schedule. And you'd be mm. surprised at how, like, um, how difficult this is for people or how rare it is for for people to actually eat on a very regular schedule. So like breakfast, same time of day, lunch, same time of day, dinner, same time of day, snacks, standardized. Um, so we're looking at like regular eating schedule and of like big square meals. So um, the way that we define a, a square meal would be a meal that contains uh, a protein source, a um, complex carbohydrate. If people are open to eating grains, great time for grains. She can also do potatoes and things like that. Um, a vegetable and then a healthy fat source. So just like a very sort of, you know, sort yeah. of plate diagram type meal. Um, prior, like a, a priority on protein, especially lean protein, that's going to help um, keep dietary fats down. Lots of fiber because fiber helps with um, blood sugar regulation and cholesterol. Um, and I'm, like mostly whole foods. You don't want to be, um, you know, nitty about only eating whole organic unprocessed. Like you, there is certainly space for, uh, indulgent foods and, you know, women should feel empowered to do them, but we just want to look at like, you know, the diet pattern as a whole and what foods are contributing the most calories to the diet. And most of them should be foods that are whole foods. Um, and that creates a really nice baseline. And when we have a really nice baseline, we can make really well-informed changes. So a lot of people go for the overhaul approach, but they don't even know what it is that they're overhauling. They just start making weird changes to their nutrition uh, without any amount of control in the process. So if you've set that baseline, you may find that you actually don't need to make very many uh, changes at all. It may just be like, hey, we're going to bump up protein and take a little bit because that's on the low side. And maybe that's it. Maybe everything else looks okay. Like you don't necessarily need to do a 16 hour fasting window because if you eat more protein, it's gonna be a little easier to control your calories or, uh, you know, same thing with fiber. If we eat more fiber and bring the calorie density of our foods down, maybe it, we don't have to work so hard to create that deficit. So, um, yeah, we, we just look for a really solid baseline and then assess what that individual might benefit from, um, yeah, on an individual level. I love that. And I, and I will share that 
it really does work. I mean, and sometimes you have to teach yourself these things. Like I, the amazing amount of benefit I have seen in my own training, recovery and life from adding one piece of toast to my morning breakfast has been, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not overselling it. It's been unbelievable because I'd always yeah. just be like, Oh, I'll just have, do I need two pieces of avocado toast with my two eggs? You know what? As a matter of fact, yeah. I do. Because you if I don't, do. I am starving at 1030. I ride my bike two hours a day, you know, all the yeah. things I lift. And like, why that was a mental hang up? What, what, got, what brain worm was infected in there? Who knows where it came from? I mean, God yeah. knows I write about this stuff for a living. But, but once I let myself truly just like eat. Yeah everything my blood sugar got better my weight got stable I my moods were better I wasn't like constantly in the kitchen with a spoon being like anything what you know yeah. it's, but like you're saying it's just like literally one unbelievably small change it's just like you like you need to eat it's amazing how <laughs> hungry women and people will let themselves get and I'm like I mean you you probably are having menopause symptoms but also you, you might just be kind of hungry and that's making everything worse so if it's just that's like the, the breakfast thing is such a major one. Like it's so many, so many women, either they skip breakfast altogether or they have like a cup of yogurt and a, you know, one piece of dry toast. And it's like the amount, the data behind, uh, I mean, it would be a, a total, like I could do another episode, but the data behind what happens to your eating pattern, if you eat 35 to 40% of your calories in the morning hours is incredible which means like eat a huge breakfast and then have a snack after that. And then see if you raid your pantry later in the day. Cause I you bet don't. you don't. Yeah. You don't. I can tell Doesn't you, happen. you don't. It's Doesn't like, happen. it's, it's really, I mean, and even sometimes I usually wake up hungry. Um, but even when I'm not super hungry, I still eat that same. I, like you were saying consistently, like, I'm like, I'm going to use this. I have a full day ahead of me. You know, I, yeah. I am going to fuel myself and, that's a tangent we don't need to go on, but I had a conversation with someone about fasting and about how problematic it is that most people, when they do it, especially women, just like cut off that early feeding time, mm -hmm. you know, and then all of a sudden they're just setting themselves up for this, every, this spiral that's just not healthy that goes into the, the rest of their day. Yeah. If people want to fast and they want to flip it around and do uh, basically early time restricted eating, which means you start eating at seven or 8 AM and you stop eating at three or 4 PM. Fine. There's great data behind that, but a lot of people don't know that. And so they think fasting and they're like, well, I'm going to delay my first meal until 12 PM. And it's like, that's backwards. And that's going to have a horrible impact. Number one on your, your mood, your energy level, your blood glucose, but you're also now eating at a time where your body actually doesn't use calories as effectively. So uh, anyway, yeah, definite tangent on that one, but. And disrupts your sleep. I mean, I did a whole piece mm -hmm. on how you know, low energy availability in reds can really mimic and mirror perimenopause, you know, and oh sometimes God. it's hard to tease out what is what. Yep. Yeah. yeah. That's if you create a baseline, it's almost, it works almost like a diagnostic tool. It's yeah. like, let's create some stability here so I can understand uh, more thoroughly what's actually going on and what might just be an energy issue. Yeah. No, I love that. So pivoting a little bit to lifting, um, because you you did a really interesting post and and I know that you're also about fitness and maybe we can talk about that in mm -hmm. at the end of the show but um you did this interesting post about not training hard enough which caught my eye because muscle is really hard to make at this point of life I mean it it, it gets harder with menopause for sure perimenopause is a precarious time for muscle loss but I too suspect that many women are not self-selecting the appropriate training loads. And that's what you were really talking about with this uh, 2022 meta-analysis. Can you, mm. can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So what that meta-analysis showed, it's, it's interesting because it looked um, at a number of studies as meta-analyses do. And it's when I'm looking at research, I kind of, I try to look for meta-analyses or system, um, system, oops, user got a call. I try to look for those because they, um, it's, they consolidate and they start to pull out relevant in information. And so what this one did is they, uh, they found that when people self self-select loads, uh, for working sets on any movement, it's not just squats or just presses or anything. It's any movement between five and 15 reps. They're selecting on average 50 53% of their one rep max on the lift, which means that, um, 
to break that down and what it would actually look like for someone doing a set of 10 back squat, they would be leaving 10 to 12 reps in reserve, meaning that the weight, when they stop at number 10, they could yeah. do another 10 or even more than 10, which means, um, you know, and we know that in order to get the right stimulation to create, um, muscular adaptation, we need to be leaving two to three in the tank. Like we need to be working kind of near failure. And so uh, it just means that a lot of people are are in the gym. They're, they're going through the motions, they're doing their sets, but they're not doing them at a, a weight that's appropriate for making the progress that they want to make. And so a lot of people spend a lot of time in the gym and they're like, well, nothing's changing. This gym routine isn't working or you know, whatever, but it's like the gym routine would be fine. The program will be fine. You just need to be doing heavier weights. It's tricky. Um, because I think, especially for women, there's a lack of experience that, um, comes into play. There's a fear of getting hurt. A lot of women are fear mm. of getting, are afraid of getting hurt in the gym. And then, you know, they're also people really struggle to invest in, um, this aspect and this component of health. So, you know, if you're, you're, I, and I think this is probably because a lot of people just haven't had it modeled that it's okay to spend several hundred dollars a month on fitness. Um, and that may be necessary, especially if you're new to it, to work with someone who can help you understand movements. They can help you with mechanics. They can help you with loading. They can help you build the confidence that, uh, frankly, you, you need to have in order to select appropriate loads for exercises. And that, uh, I mean, I've seen people go through that, um, in a number of gyms that I've, I've been in and it can take years to develop that confidence. It's certainly, I would say on average for most women, if they're new to training in their forties, fifties, or sixties, it would take a minimum of six months to, you know, working with someone who can kind of, you know, assure you, help you to develop that, uh, prerequisite confidence and frankly, like skill and proficiency with movements, um, to be able to start to put weight on the bar. But if you never, if you never get to that point, it's very, it's hard to make progress. Yeah, that's, that's a hundred percent true. And I, I really, I'm starting to see it happening in the mainstream and I, I really want to push it even more. Like, for so, 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 so long. I mean, it was this whole idea that cardio was king for everything, you know, good for your heart, good for fat, blah, 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 blah. But now like there's a real understanding of the metabolic importance of muscle tissue, right? Like muscle tissue for your health. And it creates all these great hormones like irisin that is good for your brain and create, you know, I mean, we, I'd love to see it flipped that if you do nothing else, you should do resistance training. Right. Yeah. I mean, like that's I would... kind of what we, we preach and it's, you know, muscle is your, that's your only metabolic currency. That's it. Yeah. Um, that's what drives your base metabolic rate to the, the largest degree. And it's the only way that you can increase it. Like it's certainly, it's good to get your heart rate up a few times a week, a week, hundred percent. Like there's benefits there, but mm -hmm. if you can only do one thing, especially as you get older, strength training is that thing. And then go on walks. Those are like, if you could, if you can strength train and you can walk, you're going to be in pretty good shape. Yeah, I yeah. would agree with that. Meredith, if you had a magic wand and what would your perimenopause and menopause look like? Like what would that universe look like when you reached that stage? Oh, geez. Uh, Well-informed, I guess, mm. is what probably what I would hope for is just that the, the amount of information uh, that we have on women's health continues to grow. The amount of research, uh, continues to increase. We continue to develop pharmaceutical products that can help women. Uh, and it's just, I hope that society is in a better place and the medical systems in a better place. And that I can benefit from that because, you know, I, I know that I don't have a whole lot of control over how it shows up for me. Um, so I just hope that I, I get to work with people who, uh, have an understanding of it and I have some, mm, yeah, well-developed tools in place at that time. Excellent. Well, this has been really great. I appreciate you. I appreciate what you and Alex are, are building and what you're doing and the messaging that you have. Is there anything that we have not talked about that you wanted to share or express? Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, what we talked about on our podcast with, uh, with Beth about menopause is, is just like, you know, people and, and women really struggle to believe practitioners when they tell them things. 
um, you know, they still struggle when they see it. They might believe what their friends say, but they, what women and what people will believe hundred percent of the time is what they tell themselves. And so what we try to do is, you know, tell women a different story about themselves and help them understand and believe in what they are capable of and what they can still do. And that even if they're suffering with, um, symptoms of, of menopause or other things, like it's, it's not just menopause, even if they're just whatever you're suffering with, um, you know, you're not broken, your body's not broken. Um, you don't need to give up. You don't need to throw in the towel. Some days may be really hard. Some days may be better. So you just do what you can on, um, on the day and, um, you know, take control of what you can take control of. Perfect. I'm going to stop recording. Well, that's our show. Come on back next week when I sit down with elite Canadian runner and high performance coach, Sarah Golish. And we talk all about how she is learning to conquer and sometimes make peace with her perimenopause monster. It was a really fun one. So come on back for that. And until then, as always, stay feisty. You've been listening to Hit Play, Not Pause, a feisty menopause podcast for active performance-minded women. I'm your host, Celine Yeager. The show is edited and produced by the strong, talented, and amazing women at Live Feisty Media. Follow us on social media at Feisty Menopause. And please help us spread the word. Screenshot and share this episode on your social media channels with the tag at Feisty Menopause. Share the show with your friends. And please subscribe, like, review, and rate this show wherever you get your podcasts. Word of mouth and good reviews make it easier for other listeners to find. Thanks for listening, and as always, stay feisty.